Last week we began the study of Daniel and beginning in chapter number one gave a little historical context. If you would uh, look with me at chapter one and verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. As we begin looking at this book, we realize very quickly of a few things from the historical context. Uh, number one, that God is in control. As we study the Old Testament, uh, really it's a, a study of how God goes from the fall of man there in the Garden of Eden to the time when Israel will be placed back in the land and all of the, um, all of the prophecies that God had put forth through the different prophets, all of, of the expectations for the Messiah, they were all going to come to fruition when um, e, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are going to go back and build the wall, build the temple, and the people are going to be back in the land. But as we look at Daniel chapter 1, we see uh, one of the times when Israel um, is taken out of, of the land. Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene, um, and we see here in verse number 2 that the Lord gave Jehoiakim into his, his hand. Um, this would not happen if God... Uh, did not allow it. And we see the, the sovereignty of God and the working of God uh, in the, the life of, of his people, uh, even in the midst of their um, in the midst of their turning away from him, in the midst of their sinful lifestyle. Um, you know, God is working. You know, oftentimes as we uh, look at our life, you know, we um, maybe at times foolishly believe that God doesn't care or God isn't uh, on our side or he's not working on our, our behalf because we want everything to go according to our plans and to, be, and to be perfect. And if you've lived for any length of time, you know that's, that is not the case. And if you've studied the Bible, you know that, that God uses all the circumstances of our life to, for our good, but ultimately for his glory and for his Purpose, and that's what he's doing in the, in the life of, of Daniel. We see God using uh, human, even sinful agents, to work out his his plan. And so the Bible tells us that God allowed this to happen to the nation of Israel. And there, in this time, this is the first of three times that Nebuchadnezzar is going to bring Israelites to uh, from their land to Babylon. And um, it is in this time that he begins to take. From the temple of God, uh, the tools and the, the vessels, and he takes them to honor his gods and his land. And it is this time that the Daniel and, and his friends, those that we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are taken uh, from the land and were introduced uh, to these young men. And we, have, we get a, a great picture. Uh, really, of these men as we begin in chapter number one. And that's what I want us to see tonight, moving from the historical context to looking at uh, really the, the character, uh, particularly of, of Daniel. And many sermons have been preached from this, many topics have, uh, you know, about compromise and not compromising and taking a stand and all that have been uh, given to us from that. And there's a lot of principles for us. But one of the great things that we see in this passage is the, the character of these individuals. Lord, we pray tonight that you would, Lord, challenge us uh, from your word. I pray that you'd work in our hearts and lives. And Lord, we just thank you for uh, the work you're doing through our WANA program next door and then even on our hearts and lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me ask you a question. Five years from now, there's a, a new president. Uh, somebody that's anti-God, anti-Christianity, anti-church, and the laws are passed that you can't worship God in the way that you have been able to freely worship God. And now we've enjoyed freedoms, and, and, and I think that, that would be a hard scenario, but it's not an impossible scenario to come to. I mean, it, it, it could be a, a reality for us, and, and maybe in some of our lifetime, that, that time will, will come. 
And, and let me ask you, what is your reaction going to be? Now, for many Christians on a Sunday night, you know, you're the, the faithful one, you know, pastor, you're preaching to the, the choir. For many of us, it's easy to sit here and say, oh, I'd stand up for God and I wouldn't compromise and I would, you know, I would want to stand up for the Bible and for righteousness and for truth. And, and let me ask you, do you do it today? See, it's easy to say that when that day comes, you know, people say all the time, I would die for my faith. I would die for the gospel. I would die for, I'd give my life for Jesus Christ. And you know, I'm sure if you've been in church any length of time, you've probably heard a preacher say, how do you say you would die for Christ if you're not willing to live for him even today? And, and, it's, and it's easy when you're in your land and you're comfortable and you're, you're at home with your parents and, and you're, you, know, you have your law and you have your uh, commands and you have your way of life as Daniel and his friends had back at home before Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene. And, and it's easy to, to stand up and, and do right. But, I, but what happens when all of that, when all of that changes? in your life, and, there's a, and life is turned upside down, and now you're in a, in a different place. Because the reality is, is that, you know, we don't, it might not be that your life gets turned upside down because Christianity becomes illegal, but maybe there's a hardship in your life, or something moves you away from what you're used to, and maybe your job changes, or your finances change, or a health issue comes up, or just some major life circumstance, or even something small, somebody talks bad about you, or gossips about you, or takes your parking space, or sits in your chair, or something like at church, or whatever. What, I mean, how, what is your reaction, you know, going to, to be? We, we look at the, the, the drastic and say, man, I would serve God, and I would honor God, and I would do right, and I would live for God, but, but what are we doing in the, in the little things of life? You know, the Bible tells us that we're to, in honor, prefer one another. We're to love one another. We're to sacrifice and we're to submit ourselves. And, and yet it seems like more and more in the church today, as Christians, we proclaim that we love God and we'd stand for God, but we're not willing to obey in just the, the little everyday activities, the little everyday things of, of life. And we're going to look at Daniel's reaction and, and how he purposed in his heart but I want to submit to you that, that it, it didn't take Daniel to go from his homeland to Babylon to stand up for God. Right? I believe, personally, that this was a normal way of life for him, where he was back home with his friends and with his family, that Daniel did what, was, what God wanted him to do, and Daniel lived for God, and he honored God. And tonight as we come and we look and we, we're encouraged at this man and we're challenged by his life, I, I don't want you necessarily to think of, of the drastic and what would happen if I'm, you know, if I'm taken to an Islam country and they take me prison, would I stand up for the cause of Christ? I mean, we're really not in danger of that today, but we are in danger of going to work tomorrow. Well, some of us are. Some of you are with the holidays and all that. But you're going to have to go on Tuesday you're in danger of going to the, the supermarket, and you're in danger of interacting with other believers in our church. And, and so often, you know, it's, it's in these times where we're, we're at peace and life is just normal and all that, that we struggle following simple Bible principles and living our life for God. It's in these times that, that we're mean and arrogant and uh, we get angry because everything isn't the way that we want it to be. And, and, and listen, don't, don't say we're going to live for God when it's difficult and, and you know, we, 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 we're not going to do it today in the, in, the, in the little things. Because the truth is, and those of you that, that have raised kids, if you're not consistent in the little things each and every day, your kids are going to be terrors later on, right? If you're not consistently getting them to, to do things, it's always interesting to watch the mom. We had a, I've learned this morning that I have to be careful what I say when I'm preaching. I talked about being the favorite child in our family. My sister posted on the sermon this morning that I was right. 
So luckily, I said something that was, that was first of all, true. I love, it when the pre- I love it when the preacher says, I'm not, just, I'm not just preaching up here. I'm telling you the truth. But um, I, I told you what was true, and she recognizes it. That's good right there. But, um, but you know, I, I was back in our church in Virginia. There was a nice couple, sweet couple that came to our church. And the, the mom had these little clicky shoes on her daughter. Daughter's, you know, just learned to walk and runs around the auditorium. And these clicky shoes, and she's, she has them because um, she always wants to know where her daughter was. So after two services, I told her, listen, I'm disciplining you out of the church if that kid comes back with those, with those shoes again. Um, but the, the, the poor mom, I mean, she would tell her daughter, she would say, quit doing that. All right, you're going to get a spanking if you keep doing that. Now, I said stop doing that. Okay, I'm going to count to three. All right, now I mean it this time. And you know where I'm going with that. She just goes on and on, and all of a sudden, she just explodes in anger and frustration because the kid's not listening. Well, the issue started 18 times ago, but there was no consistency in, in, in what you were saying. And so what happens is, you know, you react in a way that's inappropriate. You see, the Christian life is really, I believe, just a life of faithfulness, a life of consistency. It's a life of just doing the things that God has, has called us to do. You know, being a Christian is not hard. You know, we, we oftentimes make it out to, and, and even preachers are a part of that. I know it's hard to read your Bible every day. Listen, you have no problem getting on your Facebook page or your social media page every day, all right? It's not that hard. You, you, you do what, what you love. You choose to do what, what you love. You know, listen, it's hard to get up on Sunday, but listen, Monday through Friday, you have no problem getting up three hours earlier. Why? Because you have to get the paycheck. You have to pay your bills. And, and listen, you should be a good employee. You should be there on time, but you do the things that you love, you choose to do the things that you, that you love. You know, it's, it's easy to treat people that have the same personalities and the same likes as you. It's easy to treat them, treat them good, right? It's more difficult when you disagree with somebody. But God says that you're to love them and you're to, to prefer over yourself and be willing to sacrifice and, and to show care and kindness. And, and it, you have to be con- consistent. And see, being, the Christ, being a Christian today is just, just being faithful, just living a consistent life, doing the things that God has called you to do. You know, in everything, we're to give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. That's God's will for your life. When's the last time you honestly thanked God for something? Now, I love Daniel chapter 1, and I love to, you know, just his, his cause and his purpose and but I think this starts way back before he ever gets to Babylon with consistent living. Now, I don't know, I mean, what his life was like. I do know that the Bible never gives us anything sinful about Daniel's life that he did. I'm sure he, you know, did things wrong in his life. I'm sure he, you know, beat up his brothers and sisters and whatever else he did in life. I'm sure he, you know, did things wrong and and all that type of stuff, because he was human, and we know according to Scripture, all are sinful and, and deal with those issues. But the reality is, is we, you know, we make those major decisions. Many times it's because of the consistency of life that bring us to that point. It's just the little things that bring us to that point in our life. And I think we have to be, be careful to... To not to or to look at the to not look at the big thing and say if this happens then this is what I would do, and start focusing on okay what am I supposed to be doing today? I'm a wife. I'm supposed to submit and you know honor and love and care. I'm a husband. I'm to love and honor and care. I'm a child. I'm to obey my parents and the Lord. And and if I'm an employee, I'm to submit to. And, and, and as a believer and a brother in Christ, we're to do these things. As a Christian, I'm to, to serve God and preach the gospel, and I'm to read the Bible, and I'm to, to, to walk in the Spirit, not after the flesh. I'm, these are the things that we're supposed to, be, supposed to be doing, but we'd rather focus on the, the big things of life instead of the, the little things in life. 
That's extra. Now we'll get to the sermon tonight. But I hope that you will consider your life and the consistency of just faithful living for God and being who God wants you to be. It's not about the big and the extravagant and and all that. It's about just being the believer that God wants you to be and being where you are. Going back to this morning, using your gifts and abilities that God has given you for the body of Christ and for glorifying Him with your life. And that, that comes by just simply being faithful. Simply being faithful and serving and and being the Christian God wants you to be. So moving on from the historical context, we begin to be introduced then to uh, these men in Nebuchadnezzar. So number two, the second thing we see in this passage in verse through seven, verses three through seven, is we see Nebuchadnezzar's command. Nebuchadnezzar's command. The Bible says the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed, and of the the princes. And so we see that he didn't just choose anybody off the street. All right, and I want you to see Daniel's heritage, Daniel's background. Obviously, Daniel was somebody of of privilege, of importance, because uh, Nebuchadnezzar gave a command, and he said, these are the guys that I want you to choose, and you should bring of the, the children of Israel, of the king's seed, and of the, of the princes. I want you to bring the important, if we could say, children in their society, and those uh, that are the, the heirs of the rulers, and, and those that are educated, it says in verse 4, children whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Nebuchadnezzar wanted those that, that had skill, those that had uh, abilities and talents, those that, that he could uh, ma- even believed he could manipulate and use for his benefit. I think there were several reasons he wanted these particular uh, people. Number one, he thought that because of the qualities of of their life and their background, um, he would be able to instruct them and teach them. Uh, But number two, I believe he thought these important people would allow him to have influence over the common people. I mean, if I can get the leadership on my side, then maybe I can, it'll be easier to control uh, the regular people there that we're going to bring and deport later on. And so I want the best. I want the rulers. I want the king's kids. I want the princes of their time. And I want those that are skillful and have abilities that we can influence, those that other people look up to. If I can impact them... Listen, there's a very important point here, right? Everybody has people that look up to them, right? Everybody in this room has somebody that looks up to them. And the the truth is, is the world wants to influence you so that you then have a certain type of influence on, on others. You know, we, we see the battle in education today, and, and the, the reality is, is, you know, you hear a lot about the, the money and the finances, but, you know, the battle between public education and Christian education and homeschooling, it, it's more than just money, right? It, there's a money aspect to it, but listen, the government and the government schools, they want to control our children to influence them and to indoctrinate them. They want to have an influence upon them. Why? Because then those people are going to have influence on others. And that's where they want to start. They want to start by having that influence. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted. I want the kids. I want to bring them in and these, these young people. And, and I want to bring them in and influence them. And, you know, it's estimated that Daniel was in his teenage years. Realize, you know, teenagers are influential. They're easily influenced, but they're also influential to others. And we have to be careful uh, to make sure that our influence on them is what it's supposed to be. Our influence as a believer in Jesus Christ, as an example of what it is to be a, a Christian, to be a, a Christian wife and a Christian husband, you know, they, they see. And, and listen, I, and be very clear and understand, your kids, your teenagers, they listen to what you do more than they listen to what you say. Right? And they're influenced more by your actions than by the words that you tell them. And, and, and they're, listen, they're influenced. 
And every decision, every bad attitude, every good attitude, every right decision, every wrong decision has an impact upon your, upon your children. Listen, I have a four-year-old daughter who thinks she's 37, right? And I see it already. I see it already. I say, quit talking like your mom. No, I'm just kidding. And um, <laughs> she won't watch this later, so I'm okay. I'm okay. We're going to keep this between us, people. All right. You know, there's, we influence our children, and, and I see myself and my son and, my, and both my boys. I see myself and my daughter, and, and that's a scary thing for me as a father, and that should be a scary thing for you. And listen, if your children are sassy and smart Alex, probably question where they're getting that from, and generally it starts from home, so we have to be very careful your children are disrespectful and rude, if your children like to gossip and talk about people, I'd make sure that I'm not the one that's influencing them, but I'm doing whatever I can to curb that and make sure I'm influencing them in a different path, in a different way. He wants these young people to come in to influence them because he wants to use them. He wants to set them up as the rulers over the other Israelites that can have an impact upon them. He says, the king appointed them then daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now these are their uh, Hebrew names. Unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and unto Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Isn't it interesting when we think about Daniel, we as a, as a church, we keep his, his Hebrew name, but all the other guys, we always call them by their Persian names. You know, I don't know why that is, but you know, we write songs about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but not, you know, anyway, that's a whole other sermon for another day. But he's influencing, you know, these influ- he's influencing them. But I want you to notice there, for three years, for three years, now, we put the focus because of Daniel purposing in his heart not to eat the king's meat. We put the focus on the, the food. But this is a three-year period. Why did it take three years? It wasn't just about the meals that they ate. This was about the classes that they took and the influences that were upon uh, their life, and they knew that it was going to take time, and Nebuchadnezzar knew that he was going to have to spend time and resources influencing these individuals, these Hebrew children. And I want you to notice in verse 6, the words, now among these were. Now, we don't know how many there were, and everybody assumes that everybody else did wrong, and these four guys did right. Now, is that a good assumption? I'm, I'm sure it is, but I have no idea. But these are the four that God emphasizes for us in the story of of Daniel. And I'm not going to go one way or the other, but I think God brings our attention to these four, particularly in verse 8 then uh, and Daniel. So we see Nebuchadnezzar's command and we move on then to Daniel's desire not to defile himself or Daniel's desire to please God or Daniel's desire not to compromise whatever title you want to give to this section. And it says there, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse, likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servant. So after we're introduced to Nebuchadnezzar's plan, we're introduced to Daniel's, really his stand. Daniel's willingness to to stand up for what he believed 
is right. Obviously, the meat and the, the drink that was going to give them was going to be something that would defile themselves. And Daniel says, I'm not willing to to do this. And the Bible uses the word purpose. Now he made the decision in his life that he was going to stand up for what he believed was right. Now I believe that Daniel was trained in the law. I believe that Daniel knew what God's desire was for him in his life. I believe that Daniel was influenced by his parents and other people. And, and, but I believe that Daniel had, had, had lived this way up to this, up to this point. When, when life was easy and, and everything was going well, Daniel had lived this way. So now the drastic situation comes. The, the moment comes and the decision has to be made. You know, a lot of our issues could be solved if we would make decisions long before the situation happened. We do premarital counseling and uh, one of the first things I tell them in our um, premarital session is that Summer and I, before we got married, had a discussion and we decided that divorce was never an option. Murder, yes, but not divorce. All right? So divorce was never an option. And we decided that was, it was never to be used as, used as a threat in our home. Well, we'll just get divorced. Or it, it, it's never to be used because, listen, is Summer, are Summer and I going to argue? Have we argued since we've been married? Listen, there's times when she was wrong, so we just had to argue. All right? no, but there's been times where we disagreed, and we had differences of opinion on things, and there were times when you know, we were upset with each other. That happened. But, it, but the decision to whether or not we were going to get divorced was not made at that moment. Listen, will she be upset with me going forward at some point? Come on, we all know, all right? Some of you know me better than others. She's going to be upset with me somewhere down the line. It's, but, but the decision is not going to be made to whether or not we're going to be, stay married. And the, one of the problems we see in couples today is that decision is not made. Divorce is not a big deal, and it's not a decision. So, so when things get tough and life gets hard, then the easy thing is in that moment... What they believe is to sever the relationship because they don't understand the consequences that are going to come and all the difficulties that might come down, that will come down the road. They're just thinking right now in this moment, what do I believe is best for me? I was talking to Brother Mike this morning about, you know, just people in general. You know, the sad thing is in our, in our world, if, if you were to offer somebody $500 or $100 a week for the next year, or $500 right now, I believe 90% of people would take the $500 right now. Because we just think about the moment right now, the current situation. We don't think about, and then we take the $500 and then we blow it and we come back and say, can I have more money? No, you made your decision. You could have had $100, you could have had $5,200 over a year, but you chose the $500 right now. You know, we see stories like that in the Bible, don't we? Over birthrights and soup and all that stuff, you know. I want right now, and I want, I want now. And what happens is they didn't make the decision. We don't make the decisions when we need to make them. We wait till the moment, in the heat of the moment. And a lot of believers struggle and, uh, because we, we haven't made the decision. So something pops up on your computer that's immoral or ungodly. You should have already made the decision that you're not going to look at that. Because if you're waiting to that moment, your flesh is going to fail and your flesh is going to be weak. And it's going to be a lot harder decision. But if you have chosen, I'm going to honor God with my eyes and my heart. I'm going to honor my wife with my eyes and my heart. I'm not going to look at that. The decision is already made. There's no decision. It's not an easy decision, but there's no decision because it's already made. And the same thing with, you know, raising your children and just every aspect of life. The decision has to be made. And I believe that Daniel purposing in his heart didn't happen that moment when the guy said, here, you need to eat this meat and drink this uh, drink from, from Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel purposed in his heart and made the decision a long time ago. You know, think about church. You know, I think a, a lot of people haven't made a decision to be faithful in church. And so, what they're, so they're not. 
Church is something that, that is a decision in the moment for a lot of people. And the circumstances around their life determine whether or not they're going to go to church. Well, listen, I'm tired when I get up in the morning. I, oh, I'd rather just sleep in. I'd rather go play golf. Or my buddy calls me and says, hey, I got a tea time at 11 o'clock. Well, I guess, I mean, it's the Lord's will for me to go play golf. He said it at 11 o'clock, and so I'm going to go, you know, play golf. And, but if we make the decision that church is a priority, worshiping God with other believers, with the body of Christ, is a priority in our life, then the decision isn't made on Sunday morning. You know, on Facebook, you see the thing that um, going around, I've seen it several times, maybe you've seen it. Church should be the excuse why you miss everything else. Not everything else should be the, re- the excuse why you miss church. But it's been, and the reason that is is because we, we don't make the decision that God and worshiping Him and the corporate body of believers together is a priority for us in our life. You know, when I became a believer and joined our family. I mean, there was never a decision where I was going to be on, on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and if there were revival services and youth activities. There was never a decision that had to be made. I, I knew I could look at the church schedule and basically give you my itinerary for life. This is where I was going to, to be. And this is what I was going to be doing because the decision was already made that the church and corporate worship and, and serving God in the local church, that was a priority. For me and in our family. That was a decision that was already made. But so many have not made that decision in life. Why is it so difficult for you to go to church? Because they never made the decision that's a, that's a priority in their life. You have to choose that and make that a, a priority and emphasize it. Because if you wait till the moment, listen, with the moment's difficult and hard, or there's something else that you know your flesh want, would rather do than than that's going to win over and that's going to be weak. But the Bible tells us that Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel desired to to please God, not to, notice what it says there, defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. So we see here from the scripture that that was that was wrong for him to do. He knew it would go against what God wanted. He knew it would go against God's expectation for his life. And so that would, the Bible says it would defile him. And that was Daniel's desire, is not to defile himself. I, I believe that Daniel, as I've already mentioned, knew what God's expectation was for his life. I think a lot of people get to situations and they fail because they don't know God's expectation. Because they don't read the Bible. I don't know what God's word says in certain areas of life. And, and I, I know many that profess to know Christ as their Savior, and they, they know absolutely nothing about the Bible. Well, let me take that back. They know enough to misquote it and take it out of context and try to use it against others. But the reality is, is we, don't, we don't know because the Bible isn't a priority and they don't know God's expectation. But Daniel knew for some reason that this would not be the right thing for him to do. And so he re- makes the request of these individuals. And Daniel found favor, notice there, and I believe this this is a big deal here in this passage of Scripture, particularly the Bible says Daniel found favor in those that were over him, those that he was serving. I think Daniel's personality, his attitude, his respectfulness, uh, his demeanor, uh, he found favor. And so he was able then to make a request. He was able then to influence even his, his captors. Daniel, was, Daniel found favor, and he was able to have an influence on this, on this man. And he was able then to make this request. And the request is, give us, give us 10 days. And then, so then the fourth thing we see here is the success, the success of this test. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and, and fatter and flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Now here's what I want you to see. I bet there were a lot of people that were mad at Daniel for standing up for what is right. Because what does the Bible tell us? Not only did Daniel not have to eat the meat and drink the wine, but the Bible says after the test and the successful test, they took it from all of the other people. And 
in my sanctified imagination, in my version of the story, I can picture everybody being upset with Daniel because they enjoyed, they were, they were satisfying their flesh, even though they were defiling themselves and doing something that would go against what God would want. They were enjoying it and they were um, indulging themselves. And the Bible says that they took it from, from all of them. And listen, when you stand up for what is right, it's not going to necessarily be the popular decision in life. It's not always going to be what everybody else wants you to do. And sometimes it, it, makes, people, it makes people irritated. And what, but what I've realized is, is that people, though their, their anger is directed at me, many times it's because the Holy Spirit's convicting them in their own life. And they don't want to admit to their own wrong wrongdoing. But we see the success. And then fifthly, in verses 17 through 21, we then see God's blessing upon them. God's blessing. And the truth is, is I believe everybody in here that, claim, that, that professes Jesus Christ as their Savior would openly and honestly admit you want God's blessing upon your life. And that's what we see from Dan, in Daniel's life. Verse 17, as for these four children, so these four Daniel and his friends, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. And and, and listen, this is a big deal because everything going forward in the book of Daniel really stems from verse number 17 because a lot of it has to do with the issue of interpreting dreams and visions. And Daniel's influence and his teaching instruction to us is going to be because of his visions. And so not only was Daniel blessed, Uh, because of his stand, but now generation upon generation and the church even today is blessed because of of the visions and the writing and the scripture that God gives us through through Daniel. He goes on to to say in verse 18, at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar and the king communed with them and among them all was found none like Daniel. Daniel. Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, therefore stood they before the king. Now, I don't know how this worked, and again, I'm just speculating. The Bible says they all came in after the end of the three years, and of course, they haven't been eating the meat and drinking the wine, and, and the Bible says they were all fatter when it talked about Daniel. See? All right? I'm, just going, I'm not going there, but hey, listen. They were more plump, and they were more better to look at, and they were better fit, and they were whatever it was, and they come in, and the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar communed with them. Now, I don't know if, if the other captors and others that oversaw him came into Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, these four guys, you want to spend some extra time with them. These guys are really the ones that you want, but the Bible says that he communed with them, and they found favor in, in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes. And I I don't believe they compromised. I think they stood what was for right. And God blessed them and gave them opportunities, number one, to serve him. Also, number two, to serve others. Verse 20 then, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel now, because of his stand and his willingness to honor God, was able to influence kings and, and leaders. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to influence kings and leaders, if you'll be able to influence presidents or governors or mayors, but I do know that you'll be able to influence somebody. And what God has called us to do is to decide in our life that we are going to serve him and honor him. And we are going to influence people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have to realize that is not just through our words, but it is through our life and our actions as well. And many Christians, I believe, lose opportunity to preach the gospel and to influence people because of small decisions that they make. Decision to be angry the decision to be rude, the decision to be disrespectful, the decision to be selfish, the decision to be self-centered, 
The decision to decide life is all about me and I don't care how it influences you and, and as long as my comfort is what it is, I don't care who it hurts. And we lose opportunities. The decision to be because we have to, we have to defend ourselves to the death. We have to defend ourselves and make sure our point is, is gotten across. And so we attack people and we lose opportunities to influence. Daniel made a decision and that decision to not defile himself and to live for God and do what was right gave him opportunity not just to influence Nebuchadnezzar but all the way to, to Cyrus. Daniel had great, with different empires, Daniel was able to have great influence. Every day you wake up and you have people that come into your life, whether it's through work or your family or out at the grocery store. You have, you have people and you have, opportunity to, you have opportunity to influence those around you. You know, we hear all the time in our world that the church is losing it's influence. It's not because God has been diminished, if that is the case. But it's because we have diminished our influence in the lives of those around us. Nebuchadnezzar made a command and Daniel decided to please God instead of man. And because of that, we see the success and blessing upon his life. And we see and will see the great influence that he was able to have. I hope that your desire in life as a believer in Jesus Christ is to influence people. And if so, then it starts with the everyday little decisions that we make in our life. Let's stand together. Father, we're so grateful for your word and Lord, the example that Daniel and all these others are to us in our life. And, and tonight, as we even consider Lord, the decision that he made that gave him opportunity, I, I pray we consider our own life, Lord, and that we would, uh, Lord, make the decisions even today, Lord, that would give us influence and not hinder our influence. And Lord, that we would live lives that are honoring and glorifying to you and that are impacting this world uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.